Here we go. An amazing concept. The parasha tells us that the Jewish people, they leave Egypt, and now they're on their way to Eretz Yisrael. So now, if was one would put in his ways the destination, leaving Egypt, destination Israel, the quickest way to get to Israel from Egypt is through the land of Pilishtim. But it opens up the parashah Bishalach and says, Hashem did not want them to go the short route. The pasuk starts with, Vayhi Bishalach parotam, Velo nacham Elohim derech eretz Pilishtim. God did not want them to go the short route. Now, how short is short? It would have taken them three days travel to go from Egypt to Israel, derech Pilishtim. Hashem says, no. I don't want you to take the short route. Instead of traveling three days, I want you to travel through the Midbar for 40 years. Wow. <laughs> What a switch. Instead of three days, 40 years. You know, it's like one thing, you open up the ways, you put in a destination, and you take a look at the, at the quickest route. And sometimes it's with a toll, without a toll. And what's the difference? 47 minutes, 53 minutes, right? What's the difference already? Eight, 10, 12 minute difference between the different routes. But yet, it's boasting that it's giving you the quickest route. Over here, Hashem was telling them, I will not send you the quickest route of three days, Derech Pilishtim. Rather, I'm going to send you the alternate route through the Midbar for 40 years. Why? Why wouldn't we just go the three-day route? 40 years through the Midbar? Says Hashem, yes. Ki amar Elohim, peninachem ha'am berotam milchama v'shavu mitzrayma. If I take you the short route, you may at one point decide you want to go back to Egypt. And because Egypt is so close, and it's only a few days this way, a few days that way, so at one given point, when the Jewish people, upon their travels, they're going to end up hitting some sort of a challenge. Maybe they'll run into war. Maybe they'll run into the other challenges that they're going to have while traveling. At that moment, they might decide, you know what? Who needs these problems? Let's go back to Egypt. And because Egypt is so close, they may end up wanting to go back. Hashem says, no, no, no. I can't chance the Jewish people wanting to go back to Egypt. So therefore, I don't want to send them the short route because there's always the risk they might, they might want to turn around and go back. So instead, I'm going to send them the long route. I'm going to send them through the Midbar for 40 years. Like this, they have no opportunity of turning around about face and going back to Egypt. And the truth is, how right Bore Olam was. If you take a look at the history of the Jewish people from the following and up-and-coming parashiot of their travels in the Midbar, do you know how many times the Jewish people actually did say that they wanted to go back to Egypt? It's amazing. The Pasuk says, Zichor hadaga abatiach she'achamu b'mitzrayim chinam. They started complaining over how good they had in Egypt, the fish, the watermelon, how wonderful they had it in Egypt in the old days. They actually said one to another, here in the Midbar, what do we got? Man by day, man by night, man, man, man. Every day is Monday. We want to go back. We want to go, we want to go back. We want to go back to have real food, steaks, watermelons, fish. Yeah, they wanted to go back. And not, not, just, not just so far in, but even by the Yamsuf, one Jew turns to the other Jew, says the Pasuk, and says, Hamibli, en kevarim b'mitzrayim, there wasn't enough cemeteries in Egypt that God brought us out here to be killed? Let's go back to Egypt. Paro's coming to chase us. Put up the white flag. Let's surrender. Let's go back. So he was right. 
Hashem was right. The people actually were to entertain many, many times of them wanting to go back to Egypt in their travels to Eretz Israel. And because then Hashem says, I can't risk taking you to short route. I got to take you the long way because if I take you to short route, at any given point, they might want to go back. They might about face and just go right back to Egypt because it's so close. And the obvious question, guys, how does this make sense? Who in their right mind would want to go back to Egypt? Are you joking me? 210 years we suffered as a people in a holocaust of slavery in Egypt. You've got to know this. This wasn't just slavery. You know, every time we talk about Mitzrayim on Pesach night and slavery, what do we always think? We think like, you know, like we learned in, in American history, like the blacks that were in slavery in the South until Lincoln came along and freed them. That's the way we picture slavery. We picture a bunch of guys in a field working for a master. That's the way we think slavery. My friends, that was not Egypt. Not even close. That wasn't the slavery of Egypt. The slavery of Egypt was a holocaust. They were getting killed by the day. The taskmasters whipping them day and night. Jewish babies being put into the walls to save cement so that they don't have to waste bricks. Instead, they use Jewish babies. Jewish babies being thrown daily into the Nile River. Men being given the job of women to do. Women being given the jobs of men to do. Could you imagine women hauling a huge boulder on their shoulders, trying to move it from place to place? Yeah, that's what they did, the Egyptians. It wasn't only a physical torture, it was a mental torture. And how they destroyed the human morale and how they destroyed the Jewish soul. Vayitzak el Hashem, you know what Vayitzak means? The Jewish people screamed from bitter pain day and night, begging God to take them out of this holocaust of a slavery. And you're worried that they might want to go back? To Egypt? Who would want to go back? Who would even think of going back to that? And yet, God said, I can't take you through the short route to Israel. It's too close. Why? Because maybe the Jewish people they'll see challenges, they'll see war. They're going to want to go back. Who would want in their right mind to go back to a Gehenna like that of Egypt? How do you explain this? And the answer, my friends, is such a huge Musar. The answer is one word. It's familiar. And when something is familiar, and when we get some, when we really get used to something, no matter how rough it is, no matter how bitter the life it is, it just became the norm. That just became my life's norm. It's amazing. You know, God gave us this gift it's called a coping mechanism. Human beings learn to cope with even situations that are beyond miserable. But Hashem didn't want us to fall apart. So He gave us this gift, this strength. It's a coping mechanism that we can end up coping with, with practically anything. And somehow or other, we can even make peace with the devil himself on the worst of situations and somehow or other find a norm and a peace to survive, even in the most desperate and rotten situations, because then it becomes familiar, and then it becomes my norm. A lot of times in life, we see people struggling in certain horrible situations, and we wonder to ourselves, 
How is that person going through that? How are they surviving that? How, I, I don't get it. Sometimes you see people in horrible <coughs> financial situations and they're living in terrible, terrible, terrible conditions. And you ask yourself, my God, how, how could somebody live like that? But somehow or other, the person themselves, they're just going along with it. They're just getting through it because it became familiar. So they're coping with the situation. Sometimes, God forbid, we should never know. People fall into different sicknesses. God forbid, we should never know. And they're in such pain. The pain doesn't subside. Not day and not night. Not standing up and not lying down. They're just living with it 24-7. And you ask the person, how are you coping with that? And after a while, they just became used to it. And they ended up just coping with it. Even though it's mamash now. There's this unbelievable strength that Hashem gave us. It's a gift in a way. It's a coping mechanism that we can get used to anything. No matter how rough and how miserable it is. If it's familiar to us, we cope, we get used to it, it becomes familiar, we can actually go right back to it. And this is what Hashem told us. Mitzrayim was horrific. It was beyond bitter. But you were there for 210 years. It became your place of birth. You grew up there. You got comfortable there. You got used to there. Once that became the familiar, it became your life's norm. And now, people don't like change. People don't like new. People like when life just remains the same as they are used to it being all along. And now, I'm taking you out of that norm, bringing you into a new terrain, a desert, a travel. I'm taking you to new places that uncharted places that you've never been to before, that you don't know what's going to be lying ahead of you right away. You know what the human psyche, you know what the human reflex is? Let's go back to what I'm familiar to. Let's go back to my norm. But your norm is getting up. It doesn't matter. I got used to it. I'm comfortable with it. I prefer it than what I don't know that's coming. Hashem says, I'm scared. I'm worried about your human makeup and how connected you are to your familiar of life and your norm. I can't take you to short route. I got to take you far, far away just to make sure that you don't slip back and regress to your old norm. And this is an amazing idea. Guys, listen to me. Open your hearts. We see this all the time. We had, you know, here in the shul, every morning we have rabbis from all over the world, mamash, from all over the world, not just from Israel. We have rabbis from Mexico. We recently had a rabbi from Venezuela. He was here collecting for the, the Jewish community. It's amazing. He told us once upon a time there was 25,000, 30,000, 40,000 Jews in Venezuela before the problems, before the whole country upside down, before the dictatorship, before the whole mess. It was a vibrant country. And the Jews there, by the way, were very successful. And then, and then whole, the whole mess hit with the dictator, with the Rishayim, with the mafia, with the mess of Venezuela. Today, Venezuela is like, a, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a war zone. The whole place is upside down. The dictator destroying the country. I forgot what the guy's name was, but it doesn't matter. So this rabbi was here from Venezuela and he was collecting. He was collecting for his family. He was collecting for the yeshiva. He was collecting for the few families that are left from the 25, uh, I don't know, 2,500 families that are left out of 25,000. So I, I, I was asking the guy, like, tell me what's going on in Venezuela. And he's telling us horrible stuff, horrible stuff. It, it was like a war zone, the way he was describing it. Kidnappings and uh, martial law. It was like, not the place you want to be. 
It was one of those black and white bad places on one of those movies called The Day After. You know what I mean? It's like when the world came to an end and, and it's just the survival of the fittest. That's the way he made Venezuela sound like. So I turned to the guy and I said to him, so what are you still doing there? <laughs> what, what is your family doing? I mean, we helped the guy. But what is your family doing there? What are you doing in such a place? Pick up and leave. And he looks at me. And he shrugs his shoulders, you know. And he says, we grew up there. That's the place that we know. That's the place that we're familiar with. That's the place that we're comfortable in. That's the place that they called home. And because of that, with all of the craziness that's going on and the lousy quality of life that the whole country turned upside down to fall into, and yet, they're still there. They didn't leave because they're comfortable. It's an amazing thing. We are so accustomed to our surroundings and once we become familiar, we get so attached that boy, and, and, and between me and you guys, think about this for a minute. How many countries did the Jewish people get kicked out of? You know why we got kicked out of the country? Because if the game didn't kick us out, we would never, ever have left. Go through your history. Even Egypt. Do you know that in the Makkah of darkness of Choshech, four-fifths of the Jews died in the darkness? Why did those Jews die? By the way, you know that that number is an astronomical number. I mean, if, let's think about this for a minute. If three million people left and they only represented one of those four-fifths, that means that 12 million people, 12 million Jews, <coughs> stayed back in Egypt and died. Makat Choshech. Why, would it the 12, why did the 12 million die? The Midrash tells us because these 12 million didn't want to leave. That's why they, that's why they died. They didn't want to go. They wanted to stay. They found comfort in their misery. They said, listen, Goshen's a beautiful place. It's the nicest part of Egypt. The Jews lived in Goshen. We live in the nicest part of Egypt. Okay, listen. Paro, he has his days. Some days he's, he's nice. Some days he kills us. Some days he whips us. Some days he's good. Some days he's bad. He's like a bad boss. One day he walks into work. He's the nicest guy in the world handing out cupcakes. One day he walks into work firing people right and left. Okay, we'll deal with it. And because of that, these Jews didn't want to leave because Egypt became their norm. Hashem says, Egypt was not meant to be home. Egypt was meant to be the Kor HaBarzel. It was meant to be the furnace to cleanse you, to cleanse you, to teach you what it means subserviency to a master so that when you come out, you'll be able to be subservient to God, your true master. And instead, what did they take out of the whole Egypt experience? Welcome home. They lived in denial. <laughs> Literally, they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. The three million people that left were the ones that were ready to step up their game and follow God in spite of the leaving of their familiar surroundings. And even though they took that leap of faith, still Hashem said it's not enough. I cannot take you to short route. You're still too close to your familiar. I got to put you a distance away to protect you from your own normal, natural reaction to always want to slip back to what is normal and familiar to you. And therefore, instead of three days, 40 years in the Midbar. Guys, listen to me. This is such a big idea. This is huge. Anytime a guy aspires 
to want to do something big. And he finally grabs himself in hand. And he says, that's it. I'm going to make something out of myself. I am done with the old me. I'm done with the familiar. I'm done with the old norm. I'm ready to break the status quo. I want to step up and I want to become something real, something great, something big. I want to find purpose in my life. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going places. And he breaks out of the norm. And he breaks out of his familiar. And he takes that leap of faith to want to do now bigger things with his life. New things. New and charted places that he never tried to reach to. Now he's reaching. It doesn't, mean if it's, it doesn't matter if it's in business. It doesn't matter if it's in relationships. And especially so true when it comes to your Avodat HaKodesh. The guy that wants to put his foot down and say, my gosh, I'm already 22, 23, 25. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not in high school anymore. I want to make something out of myself. I want to be the guy that's going places. An achiever. Not a guy that's just spinning his wheels. I'm ready to break out of the familiar and the normal. Let me reach heights. And he decides. That's it. I'm keeping Shabbat now perfectly. Inside and outside. That's it. I'm not missing a day at Tefillin. That's it. I heard Rabbi's class last night from the Sigulot of Parnassah and how important it is to pray with a minyan, one of the great Sigulot for Parnassah, and to start your day off right. I'm starting Shachrit in the morning with a minyan. How am I going to wake up at 7 in the morning? I don't know. But I'm going to break that habit of being familiar, of waking up every day at 9.30, throwing on Tefillin in my bedroom, and running out the front door to go to work, and instead, I'm somehow or other going to figure out how to break out of a bad trend and become an achiever. <clears throat> I'm going to break out of my familiar and my norm because I want to be great. And at that minute, the guy comes up with a plan. And he has the inspiration and the fighting spirit to actually put it to the task. And he takes the jump, the leap of faith, and he starts doing big things. He really starts growing. Do you know how easy it is for this well-meaning, powerful guy who's reaching for the stars to so easily slip back to his old, familiar self? Do you know how easy? Do you know how many times people took upon themselves wonderful kabbalot to break out of the old familiar self and become something bigger and greater and then after a short period of time they just slip back to the old and the familiar again this isn't a story just in humash this is us everyday life hashem tells us listen you're taking the leap of faith you want to grow to be something big. You want to break out of the familiar. You want to break out of your Egypt. Don't take the short route. Go the long way. Put distance. Put place. Put a lot of barriers between you and your old familiar. If you're trying to stay away from certain bad friends... Don't think you can hang out with them and just not associate with them. It's not happening. We all know that. You got to take a clean break and take the long route far away. And if there's that person in your life that doesn't allow you to stay clean, and if there's that person in your life that doesn't allow you to be a proper shmirat of a Jewish boy, you got to break clean. Yes, yeah, so we'll just be friends. No, that doesn't work. There's no such thing as friends. There's no such thing as friends. If you're breaking, you got to take the route that keeps bis distance between you and the old familiar because it's so easy to slip right back. Says, God, I couldn't take them the three-day route. It's so easy to slip back to Egypt. It's so easy to slip back to your familiar, your norm. You got to take that long route. 
Here's a guy that decided, that's it. I want to clean up my mind a little bit. I have so much garbage inside of me. So I know that I was on, on the way to work every day when I leave at 1 o'clock to go in the city to pick up something to eat. I know that the normal walk down those two, three blocks walks me by all different types of trashy billboards. But that's the straight route, the line between two points. Here's a guy that says, that's it. I want to clean up my eyes. I want to clean up my heart. I want to clean my nishama a little bit. I want to be a better Jew, a bigger Jew, a cleaner Jew. This guy actually walks two to three blocks out of his way, roundabout, in order to get to his destination as not to come near the thing that he knows he could slip back into so easily and so quickly. You need not just to take a leap of faith, you need to play defense to avoid in a big way. That's what we're learning from this parasha. That's why he had to take us 40 years out of our way just to keep distance between us and the old familiar so that we don't slip back because it's so easy to slip back to those old Yetzirahs. Oh, are they so easy. It's like just getting right back on the bicycle. It's nothing to slip back to one of those old Yetzirahs. And here are guys that worked so hard to break them. They worked so hard to graduate from them. They worked so hard to overcome those challenges. And they psyched themselves up. And they cleaned themselves up. They made something out of themselves. And they took a leap of faith. And they went out to conquer. And conquer they did! Don't give back your profits. You profited. You made a million bucks on this challenge. Why would you want to give back your profit? Why would you want to hand it back? Stand your ground. Don't be so easy to slip back to the old gates of her, to the old famous, the old norm. But put good buffer zone distance between you and those things that hold you down. And like this, you'll continue to grow and you won't slip back into those old familiar Yetzirahs. You know the way I think about it? I know this is a lousy example, but it's a good lousy example. I like good lousy examples. It's like the guy who carries a few credit cards. Well, this is a good lousy example. He carries a few credit cards. Here's a guy who was never taught the proper art or discipline of how to manage money. Many of us, especially the young guys, starting out in life, we weren't taught yet really how to manage money. And the problem is, we get a hold of that plastic and we swipe away like nobody's business. The wives is one thing, I'm talking about the guys now. Swipe away like nobody's business. And and they don't, they don't even catch it, you know. Okay, what's, what's another lunch? Okay, what's another night out with the boys? Okay, what's another little trip? Okay, you know, Uber here, Uber there, Uber everywhere. And, and we, don't, we don't feel it. We don't feel it. All of a sudden, the end of the month comes. You open up the envelope and you take a look at the proclamation from the king of credit card companies as its page, if the page, if the page, and you're saying, holy moly, I spent all this in one month? And then you take a look at the dates, so it wasn't even a month. It was a 23-day cycle of some sort of a billing cycle that these guys come up with. And you say, how did I do this? And then at the end of the month, you look at a number that's so big that you can't pay that. So right away, what's the knee-jerk reaction? Okay, I'll pay the minimum. Next month, I'll pay it off. So we pay the minimum. The next month, we're a little bit shaken up because we got hit last month. Hit last month. And it works for a few weeks. But then at the end of the month, we carry the balance of last month. So what do we do? We pay the minimum. And then the month after that, we start getting a little bit of a better month, but we don't feel the pinch as much 
because we're two months out from the original bill. So we start going Uber here and Uber there and Uber everywhere. And then we start out again with the little business lunches. And then we start telling ourselves, no, my gosh, it's a write-off. What's the problem? We start coming up with our own brilliant excuses and we buy into our own luxury. It's unbelievable. We buy into our own garbage. And then at the end, when we're finally done, we come back to month three now and the number is exuberant. And then the salesman of all salesmen of all time, the HR shows up to the guy and says, hey, you're already in that deep. What's another month? I mean, between me and you, all you got is another two, three thousand dollars left on your credit availability anyways. So you might as well enjoy it because there's no way you're paying the first seven grand. How are you gonna pay the last three that you still have available? So habubu, go out, eat and be merry because tomorrow your credit card may die. Get it for everything it's worth. The guy's out, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you know how many guys over the years I had a coach in these areas? And it wasn't because I'm so much smarter than they. It's just that I was they when they were there at their age. I, I also went through this stuff. Who didn't? We didn't know how to handle that. As kids, 22, 23, 25, managing money, no one taught us. Who taught us managing money? We, we, we learned managing money in school? No way. Well, we were told, pass your regents and you're good. I mean, what would have to do with, what have to do with life? <laughs> what, what did it have to do with managing money? Nothing. And sure enough, the guy is stuck to the max. He can't breathe. His credit is about to be shot. His name, his reputation is about to be shot. If he ever wants to lease a car, his credit is shot. If he ever wants to buy a house, his credit is shot. His credit, his credit, his credit is shot. And here in the United States, credit... It's cash, it's, it's, it's money credit in, the, in, in America. Credit's a big thing. So the guy bugs out. He comes crying to a rich uncle that he has. He says, I'm begging you, please, I'll pay you off. I'll pay you off $500 a month for 20 months. Please, just bail me out, lend me the 10 grand. Let me just pay off this card and I'm telling you, I'm putting it away. I'm putting it away. And the uncle says, you're gonna put it away? Because I don't want you coming back to me again in another uh, year with the same mess. And I have to bail you out again another time. He says, no, no, no. I, I, I promise you, I'm putting it away. I'm putting it away. So the uncle, being the uncle, loves his nephew. He gives him the check, 10 grand. He starts paying him back. He pays off the card. He puts it away in the drawer. A few months later, he has a tight month. Guy has a tight mouth. It's normal. And he's going out that night with the boys. Mom do flus. What's he gonna do? She says, you know what? I'm gonna use it just tonight. Just tonight. And listen, he hears in the back of his head his uncle screaming, don't slip back. Don't get yourself in this again. This is a terrible cycle. Break out of it and stay out of it. Don't slip back into that norm that's easy. It's so easy to slip right back into the swiping. Eh, come on. One time. One time. Big deal. I'll put it right back in the drawer. Nothing. The guy takes it out of the drawer that night and then two weeks later and then again after that, little by little by little, he slips right back to the norm and the familiar of bad habits, and he finds himself knocking again on his uncle's door. Do you know how many times we go through this cycle? It says Bore Olam, you cannot aspire to break out of the norm and the familiar of the Yetzer Hara and bad habits. You got to rip up the card, cut it up, into small pieces and put a big distance between you and it. And that's why when it came time to leave Egypt, God couldn't take us the short route because boy, we can turn around and slip right back to the familiar and the normal. No, he had to take us 40 years in the desert just to get us away 
from what we were used to. How many guys? How many guys over the years went to Israel? They came to conquer in a new country. And they knew that they had six months, a year. And they knew they had to do everything they can with the time they had because they knew that the fact that they even got there for one year was already on borrowed time, at least in the eyes of their parents, for sure. So they got to really clock this opportunity. And they learned. And they had a great time. And the friends, and the, 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 the touring, and the hikes, and the trips, and the tiulim. But more than that, the learning day and night. The Kotel, Thursday night, Friday morning, Vatikin coming back and sleeping Friday, coming into Shabbat after an all-night learning. Wow, these were experiences that they, they, they drank from and enjoyed. And then they come back. And the first week they're back, they're on fire. They're on fire. They don't miss a minyan. They have a seder in the morning, a seder at night. And then the second week, they're still on fire. The third week, they're still telling, they're telling their parents exactly how certain things in the kitchen got to be fixed up. It's about time. Let's all graduate together as a family. And then it comes time for them to go out to work. And suddenly, those old, familiar norms come back to haunt them little by little. And they start having to have to go on the train every day and to the city every day. And little by little, it is so easy to slip back to what once was familiar and what was normal. But you fought a whole year. You fought day and night to get to where you're at. Why, why, why would you let yourself? Sometimes we don't let ourselves. We slip. And because it's so easy to come back to what was once normal and familiar, you got to fight double time to keep your profits. When you make that leap of faith and you reach that unbelievable height and the goal that you were looking to reach, you need to fight double time to keep it. Double time. And that is the message that Hashem is telling us. We are creatures of comfort. When we get comfortable with something, we're so attached that it takes literally countries to throw us out in order for us to leave. How many countries were we thrown out of? We were thrown out of Egypt. Paro was running up and down the streets the last night in his pajamas, screaming, Moshe, get out of here! Yalla roh, out! How many countries? We were thrown out of Spain. We were expelled. We would never have left. What do you mean? You know what was going on by the Spanish Inquisition? Do you know how many Jews stayed? As Moranos. In basements. They prayed in the dark. Get up and leave. No. This is our place. This is our norm. This is our familiar. We can't leave. Until they kick us out, we can't leave. And that's why Hashem made them kick us out. So that we can get away from the bad old norm and get on to bigger things, better things uncharted lands that might actually have a better opportunity. And this is the reason why, guys. Oh, this is the reason why. This is the reason why. One of the greatest memories that God tells the Jewish people in the history of the Jews. God says one of the most fond memories I have of the Jewish people is that they actually left their familiar norm environment, Egypt, and they followed me into a desert, a place that they had no idea where they were going, but they followed me anyways 
because of their leap of faith that they just wanted to be with Hashem. You broke out of your normal and your familiar for me, says Hashem. You followed me to a desert. The edits low at all. I'll never forget that moment. That moment was the crescendo, was the pinnacle of the beautiful image that God has of the Jewish people, Kivyachol, in his mind. I just wanted, I want to end off and I want to tell you something. What did we become familiar with? What is our familiar in the United States? What became our norm? What became normal to us? What do we call normal today? What of our kids growing up in a society that accepts as familiar and normal? You know, what type of atmosphere are we bringing them up in that to them these things are familiar? What's our normal today? I want to tell you a tremendous concept. The luxuries of the parents are the necessities of the children. Once upon a time, not so long ago, 10 years ago, the concept of midwinter vacation was something that some people went on, some people didn't. It depends. Families that wanted to go on vacation, the kids were off, they went. Other families stayed behind. It was like a, it was like a concept of camp in the summer. Some kids went to camp, and some kids didn't. Midwinter vacation, some families went on midwinter vacation, some families didn't. That was 10 years ago. Today? Today it's chok velo yavo. Today it's like, what's wrong with you? If you would tell somebody you're staying home for midwinter vacation, it was like, loser. You know, like, like, what does that even mean? It makes no difference if you have money or don't have money. It makes no difference if you can or you can't. Today it's not, are you going away for midwinter? It's where are you going away for midwinter? You have a choice. You can pick an island in Mexico. You can hang out in Florida. Or you can uh, go on a cruise, who, you know. But that's it. Box number one, box number two, box number three. That became the norm. And the minute someone even thinks to have the audacity, because they might not be able to afford the 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars. You're staying home? It's like everyone turns around and looks at the guy, and the room goes quiet, and all you hear is the crickets. You're staying home. Yeah. But how could you? <laughs> it's it's sacred. <laughs> Comes the 15th of January. <laughs> You're not allowed to be found in the streets of Brooklyn. But that's the norm. And you look like you're nuts. You're a loser. If you're found in shul that weekend in Brooklyn, it's like someone looks at you, I mean, what are they doing here? But it's like, they look, what are you doing here? It's like, you need a doctor's note. Something, some, some major something. But this became the norm. To take a kid to Israel and spend $100,000 on a bar mitzvah became the norm. That's what's in right now. It's the hottest thing now. Take 50 people on a bus, take them touring the whole week. One night's a bar mitzvah, another night's a bar mitzvah with orphans. $100,000. That's the norm. That's what's familiar. But what happens? Although that became the luxuries of parents, but now that's becoming the necessities of the kids. When this kid grows up and he's going to make a bar mitzvah for his kid, <coughs> there's no choice anymore. 
I mean, you want to make a Brit Mila, $30,000. $30,000 for 300 ladies and 11 men at 11 o'clock in the morning to show up to an affair. This is the norm. Guys, let people, God bless them, let people make smachot and spend. And if we're not going to spend on smachot, what are we going to spend on? Let them spend to their heart's content. God bless the people in this community. They're the biggest givers. They, they, they give like nobody else. But I just got one question. You have one kid. Because all your rest of your kids are all all-stars and they're all gonna be fantastically successful and fantastically wealthy and healthy and wonderful, just like their dad. But what happens if amongst all your kids, there's one kid that didn't make it? You know what you just did to him? He's done. You know what his marriage is gonna look like? See, he can't do the $100,000 bar mitzvah in Israel. He can't do the $30,000 Brit Milah for 300 ladies and 11 men, including the photographer, at 11 in the morning. He can't do it. What is he gonna do? How's he gonna face his wife? How's he gonna face his kids? How is he going to face the people in shul? His wife is going to walk around like I once heard one lady say, my mom said I married a loser. You know what's comical to me? I know this lady's family. Her other brothers, brother-in-laws are wealthy. But her husband is the only one that's loyal to her, his wife. I know the family. He's the loser he can't afford to make the $30,000 Brit Milah. But the other brother-in-laws, who are not husbands, who are not fathers, who are literally in China three weeks out of a month, but those are the guys that are the success stories. This became the norm? This is the society of the familia? This is the norm and the familiar that we're introducing our children into, and they're gonna pick up the ball from here to build the sweet new generation on the axes of these priorities. What are we doing? How did we forget the luxuries of the parents become the necessities of the kids? That means that all this has become the norm for our kids. How are they going to how's the next generation going to survive? How are their marriages going to survive? Their wives see that everybody else's wives is prancing around, and boy, do they take they take inventory. So they'll tell you what everybody else is wearing that they don't have. What's the husband to say? But I, I killed myself already. I. I I'm trying everything I can. No good, not good enough. You're not even living up to the standard. You're not even up to the norm. Is this the familiar that we want to bring our kids into? It's amazing. I mean, the cars we drive today, the houses we're building, for us, these are luxuries. And God bless the people. Let them enjoy it till the hilt. Don't get the wrong impression. Hashem should bless them a million times. But children are being brought up in those houses. And one day when a kid is brought up in that house, that to him is what a house looks like. So one day when he comes to pick up his house, when he gets married, inshallah, that's the house he's going to want. But he can't have it. Because not every kid can have what the parent had. But what do you mean? That's the norm. What society are we building at what familiar and at the price of what norm? What are we doing to our kids? I don't know if you remember this. I remember this. When I was growing up, before Pesach, 
I don't know. In my house, each man for himself. I had to clean my room for Pesach. My brothers cleaned their rooms for Pesach. Recently, a mother told me that she didn't ask her kid to clean the room for Pesach. Forget about that. That is you know, like the age of the dinosaurs. That's prehistoric. But her kid comes into the house, drops things all over the place. So she said, honey, pick up the stuff from the floor. You know what he said to her? We have a chedame. Why don't pick it up? That's the norm? These are the familiar? But what do you mean we have a chedame? And he calls her, the kid, calls her in, in fluent Spanish. You know, I, I laugh at this. I have kids sitting in front of me. They complain, I, Rabbi, I can't learn the Gemara. It's in a different language. Oh, all of a sudden, a different language we're deaf to. To speak to the chedamit, to pick up your underwear all over the floor in your socks as you leave a trail to the shower, you have no problem in fluent Spanish. In any dialect that she needs to hear, you understand them. You're able to, that you can tell her. But Gemara, it's an Aramaic, so it's an offshoot of Hebrew. It's not exactly Hebrew. It's only similar. No, Rabbi, I, I, I can't. I'm breaking my teeth. I can't. I, I, I speak English, Rabbi. I speak English. I speak English. Oh, now you speak English. Yeah, now I speak English. So what are we bringing up? What are we bringing up? Walking around the house, dropping stuff, let the chedame pick it up. 17 years old with a, with a license. We're not getting him Toyotas. So what are they going to get when they're 25? What's the familiar and what's the norm? Remember, the luxuries of the parents are the necessities of the kids. And as they grow up, if they don't have it, you're going to look at a very unhappy, miserable, bratty generation that if they don't get what they want and they're used to, they're going to throw a fit. Where are their marriages going to go? What are we doing? Where's the familiar and the norm? There's a quick point that I wanted to mention and I'll close. I know I'm over time. In the old country, our wonderful fathers had a maneuver between Arabs and danger. They grew up with them, but they also knew what they were capable of. And there was danger. And because of that, when they walked in the streets, they did not wear a kippah. Although their fathers and grandfathers before them always, always had their heads covered. But in the recent generations, because we grew in Arab countries, and the hostilities, and the danger, they couldn't wear a kippah. It was dangerous. The Arabs knew who the Jews were, but to put a kippah on in their eyes was like sticking it in their face, and because of that, it was dangerous. So many of our good fathers, and even grandfathers, would walk around the streets with no kippah on out of the fact that it was a hostile environment. But they knew good and well that when they came home, they would sit down to the table to eat. They knew Shulchan Aruch. You have to put a, a head covering on your head, a kippah or something, in order to be able, when making Berachot, to say God's name. You can't say God's name with your head uncovered. It's a halacha. So they all had kippah at home. They all had a kippah in the places they went to eat. That was a given. In the street, it was dangerous. So here we come to the United States of America. And the land that flows milk and money. The land of the free, the home of the brave. And there's no danger in the streets. And don't let anybody tell you, no, Rabbi, do you hear what happened in Muncie? Okay, Hazaku Baruch. There's no danger in the streets. Do me a favor. Baruch Hashem. Hashem had Rachmanut. We're still safe here. How long it'll last, we'll see. But at least for now, we're still safe. We can go up and down the streets. We don't think for a second. Why are we wearing kippot? And the answer is because that was what we're familiar with. We came from the old countries. We got used to walking around with nothing on our heads. So now that just became the norm. Okay.
but you know what happened now? Now that the fathers don't wear the kippah because they are normal, familiar with the old country, the kids who now think that that's the look, to look like a no kippah Jew, sometimes even they're embarrassed to look Jewish. So uh, we won't go that far, God forbid. But they're used to the look, no kippah. But the problem is when dad goes to a restaurant, dad pulls out the kippah and puts it on his head like he did in the old country. But his son, who got so used to here not wearing a kippah, didn't know the difference between the reason of the outside and once upon a time danger and the concept of making berachot. This kid, he goes into the restaurant and, and, and don't, you, know, you don't have to believe me on this. You walk down the block. I don't want to say on tape names of different restaurants, but walk around the neighborhood, walk in lunchtime. Tell me if you find somebody with a keep on his head, ripping through that holy whatever. Tell me, show me, tell me, tell me I'm wrong. There's no keep on, no nothing. Why? Because that became the norm, that became the familiar. We need to start educating. We need to break out of the norm, break out of familiar, and realize that we're so close. Mashiach is so close. You speak to the rabbis in Israel. Recently, I spoke to a tremendous tzaddik in Eretz Yisrael. He told me, Rabbi, Dovi, you don't know how close Mashiach is. He's standing by the kotel. I don't know what that means. But he said, he's standing by the kotel. He's standing by the kotel. He says, there's no time. We gotta break out of the familiar and the norm. We gotta take a leap of faith. Start reaching for the bigger, for the more unbelievable, purposeful life. Because if not, we'll be left behind in Egypt, attached to the familiar and the norm. <clears throat> and when will we ever break out? And if you think I'm exaggerating, forgive me for ending with a story. I gotta give you one story. I got a call, I got a call last week from a guy in the shul. And he says to me, Rabbi, tell me, what, what should I make of this? He says, this morning my son went to yeshiva. His son goes to one of the wonderful high school yeshivot in our community. He says, my son went to yeshiva. I walked by the room, I didn't know he left. I thought he was still in bed, so I walked into his room to wake him up. And although he was already out of bed, I see that on his bed, there was a letter. My son wrote a letter, and I'm thinking, my son is not exactly from the articulate. Who is he writing a letter to? So he says, I picked up the piece of paper, and I read the letter. My son wrote a letter to Kobe Bryant. Dear Kobe, you'll always be in my heart. I cried for days when I heard the news that you and your daughter passed away. I will never forget you as one of the greatest players in history. You made me happy when I watched you play. You'll always be in my heart. You'll always be in my prayers. Signed the boy's name. Welcome to the new norm. Welcome to the old familiar. Thank you for listening.